Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. I'm here at SpaceX's brand new launch facility in Boca Chica, Texas, to check out the holy grail of rocket engines, and that's SpaceX's upcoming Raptor engine. An engine like this has never actually been used on a rocket before. Now, this is a methane-powered, full-flow, staged combustion cycle engine. Talking about a rocket engine that's this complex can be really intimidating. And in order to put it into context against other engines and other engine cycles, we're gonna do a full comparison of the Raptor engine versus a bunch of other engines, including SpaceX's current workhorse, the Merlin engine, against the RS-25, the Space Shuttle main engine, the F-1 engine that powered the Saturn V, the RD-180, and Blue Origin's BE-4 that also runs on methane. And as if the full flow staged combustion cycle wasn't enough, SpaceX is also doing something else unique. They're powering that thing with liquid methane. And that's something that's actually never been been done on an orbital class rocket. So we're going to take a look at the characteristics of methane and see if we can figure out why SpaceX chose methane instead of any other common propellant. Now this engine isn't really the best at anything. It's not the most powerful. It's not the highest thrust to weight ratio of any engine. It's not even the most efficient, but it does a lot of things really, really well. So by the end of this video, hopefully we'll have all the context to understand why the Raptor engine is special, how it compares to other rockets, why it's using liquid methane, and then hopefully we'll know if it really is the king of rocket engines. Let's get started. Three, two, one, Now, in case you didn't notice when you clicked on this video, this is a very, very long video. Sorry, not sorry. But if you're anything like me, you keep hearing a lot of hype about the Raptor engine and you want to appreciate it, but you don't even know where to start. Well, I've spent quite a while really studying up on the subject so I can lay down a good foundation in order to help us really, truly, fully appreciate the Raptor engine. Well, and quite frankly, all rocket engines. And if you're anything like me, maybe you've stared at diagrams like this, or like this, or like this one, for hours until you feel like your head's going to explode. So in order to avoid that, I've actually whipped up some really simple versions of rocket engine cycles for all of us to enjoy which will hopefully help us grasp these crazy concepts. But in case this isn't your first rodeo, here's the timestamps if you want to jump to a certain section. There's also links in the description to each section as well as an article version of this entire video at my website, everydayastronaut.com, in case you want to study some of the numbers a little more in depth or see sources of some of the material. Now, we're gonna start off with a super quick physics lesson, but bear with me. We're gonna dive in and get plenty of nitty gritty details. Okay, so let's start off with this. Rockets are basically just propellant with some skin around it to keep it in place, and they have a thing on the back that can throw said propellant really, really fast. And to way oversimplify it even more, the faster you can throw that propellant, the better. Now the easiest way to do this is by storing all the propellant in your tanks under really high pressure. Then put a valve on one end of the tank and a propelling nozzle that accelerates the propellant into workable thrust. Done. No crazy pumps or complicated systems, just open a valve and let her rip. This is called a pressure fed rocket engine and there's a few main types cold gas, monoprop, and bipropellant pressure-fed engines. You'll often find these used in reaction control systems because they're simple, reliable, and they react quickly. But pressure-fed engines have one big limiting factor. Pressure always flows from high to low, so the engine can never be higher pressure than the propellant tanks. In order to store propellant under high pressure, your tanks will need to be strong and therefore thicker and thicker and heavier and heavier. Look at composite overwrapped pressure vessels, or COPVs. They're capable of storing gases at almost 10,000 PSI, or 700 bar. And despite this, there's still a limited amount of propellant and pressure they can store. And this does not scale up very well when you're trying to deliver a payload to orbit. So smart rocket scientists quickly realized in order to make the rocket as lightweight as possible, there's really only one thing they could do. Increase the enthalpy. That would be a great metal band name. <laughs> You're welcome, internet. Enthalpy is basically the relationship between volume, pressure, and temperature. A higher pressure and temperature inside the combustion chamber equals higher efficiency, and more mass shoved through the rocket engine equals more thrust. So in order to shove more propellant into the engine, you could either increase the pressure in the tanks or just shoot the propellant into the combustion chamber with a really high powered pump. Hmm. The second option sounds like a pretty good idea. But pumps moving hundreds of liters of fuel per second require a lot 
and boy do I mean a lot of energy to power them. So what if you took a tiny rocket engine and aimed it right at a turbine to spin it up really, really fast? You can exchange some of the rocket propellant's chemical energy for kinetic energy, which could then be used to spin these powerful pumps. Welcome to turbo pumps and the stage combustion cycle. But you've still got some limiting factors here, like how high pressure always wants to go to low pressure and how heat has that habit of melting stuff. <laughs> so you've got to keep all these things in check while trying to squeeze every bit of power out of your engine. Now there's actually a lot of different variations of the cycles that we could talk about, but I'm gonna stick with the three most common, or at least the three that matter the most when putting the Raptor into context. We have the gas generator cycle, the partial flow stage combustion cycle, and lastly, we'll look at the full flow stage combustion cycle. And perhaps in a future video, I'll try and do a full rundown of all liquid fueled rocket engines, including fun new alternatives like the electric pump fed engine seen on Rocket Lab's Electron Rocket. So let's start with the gas generator cycle known as the open cycle. This is probably one of the most common types of liquid fueled rocket engine used on orbital rockets. It's definitely more complicated than a pressure fed system, but it's fairly simple. Well, at least compared to their closed cycle counterparts. Now I'm gonna way, way oversimplify this so it's as easy to grasp as humanly possible. In real life, there's literally dozens of valves, a hive of wires and extra tiny little pipes everywhere, helium to back pressure the tanks, fuel flowing through the nozzle and the combustion chamber to cool it, and there's an ignition source for the pre-burner and the combustion chamber. But again, for the purpose of making this as simple and as digestible as possible, just know there's a lot of stuff missing from these diagrams. But for now, we're just gonna focus on the flow of these engines so we can grasp that concept first. The gas generator cycle works by pumping the fuel and oxidizer into the combustion chamber using a turbo pump. The turbo pump has a few main parts, a mini rocket engine called the pre-burner, a turbine connected to a shaft, and then a pump or two that push propellant into the combustion chamber. Now you might hear the turbo pump assembly called the power pack because it really is what powers the engine. In the open cycle system, the spent propellant from the pre-burner is simply dumped overboard and does not contribute any significant thrust. This makes it less efficient since the fuel and oxidizer used to spin the pumps is basically wasted. Now the funny thing about a turbo pump is that it kind of has a chicken and egg syndrome situation that makes it pretty difficult to start up since the pre-burner that powers the turbo pump needs high pressure fuel and oxidizer to operate. So the pre-burner requires the turbo pumps to spin before it can get up to full operational pressure itself, but the turbo pumps need the pre-burner to fire in order to spin the turbo pumps, but the pre-burner needs the turbo pumps to, yeah. You can see where this is going. This makes starting a gas generator pretty tricky. There's a few ways to do this, but we don't need to get into all that in this video. That sounds like a fun topic for future videos though. So back to the turbo pumps. Remember, pressure always flows from high to low. So the turbo pumps need to be a higher pressure than the chamber pressure. And this means the inlets leading to the pre-burner is actually the highest pressure point in the entire rocket engine. Everything else downstream is lower pressure. But notice something here. Take a look at SpaceX's Merlin engine, which runs on RP-1 or rocket propellant one and liquid oxygen. Notice how black the smoke is coming out of the pre-burner exhaust. Why would it be so sooty compared to the main combustion chamber, which leaves almost no visible exhaust? Well, that's because rocket propellant can get super hot, like thousands and thousands of degrees Celsius. So to make sure the temperature isn't so hot that it melts the turbine and the entire turbo pump assembly, they need to make sure it's cool enough to continually operate. Running at the perfect fuel and oxidizer ratio is the most efficient and releases the most energy, but it also produces a crazy amount of heat. So in order to keep the temperatures low, you can run the pre-burner at a less than optimal ratio. So either too much fuel known as fuel rich or too much oxidizer or oxygen rich. Running an RP-1 engine fuel rich means you'll see some unburnt fuel appearing as dark clouds of soot. The highly pressurized unburnt carbon molecules bond and form polymers, which is a process known as coking. This soot starts to stick to everything it touches and can block injectors or even do damage to the turbine itself. So what if you didn't wanna waste all that highly pressurized propellant? I mean, after all, since it's running cooler by being fuel rich, doesn't that mean there's a bunch of unburned fuel literally being wasted? What if you could just pipe that hot exhaust gas and put it into the combustion chamber? Huh? 
Welcome to the closed cycle. The closed cycle or stage combustion cycle increases engine efficiency by using what would normally be lost exhaust and connects it to the combustion chamber to help increase pressure and also increase efficiency. So let's take the Merlin engine and try closing the loop. Let's take the exhaust and just pipe it straight into the combustion chamber. Uh oh. <laughs> Oh no, we just put a bunch of soot and clogged all the injectors. Uh, you do not go to space today, my friend. But there's a few solutions to this problem. So let's see how the Soviets solved it. The first operational closed cycle engine they made was the NK-15 designed for their N-1 moon rocket. They later upgraded it to the NK-33, and then many versions from there stemmed out, including the RD-180, which is what is used on the Atlas V today. Since the NK-15 and NK-33 runs on RP-1, like the Merlin, you can't run your pre-burners fuel-rich because of the coking problem. So if you want to create a closed cycle engine with RP-1, the answer is running the pre-burner oxygen-rich. Easy as that, right? Well, now you're blasting superheated, highly pressurized gaseous oxygen, which will turn just about anything into soup, right at your precision machined, crazy low tolerance turbine blade. Doing so is actually considered impossible by the United States, and they basically gave up on trying. They didn't think a metal alloy existed that could withstand these crazy, crazy conditions. And they didn't believe the Soviets had made such an efficient and powerful RP-1 powered engine until after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the US engineers got to see them and test them out firsthand. But the Soviets had indeed worked their butts off and they had made a special alloy that can magically, with science, withstand the crazy conditions of an oxygen rich pre-burner. With a closed cycle engine, you don't just use some fuel and some oxidizer and burn that in the pre-burner to spin the turbine, you actually shoot all of the rich propellant through the turbine. So with an oxygen rich cycle, all of the oxygen actually goes through the pre-burner and just the right amount of fuel goes to the pre-burner. You only need enough to give the turbine the right amount of energy to spin the pumps fast enough to get the right pressures for the pre-burner and the combustion chamber to make the right amount of power to shoot the thing into space. It's just crazy. So back to this oxygen rich pre-burner. That now hot gaseous oxygen is forced into the combustion chamber where it meets liquid fuel. They meet and go boom and we get a nice clean and efficient burn without really wasting any propellant. But still, like all engines, the chamber pressure cannot be higher than the pump pressure, so the pumps actually have a lot of weight on their tiny little metal shoulders. Now if you're sitting there thinking that the United States just sat back and let the Soviets have all the closed cycle glory, you'd be wrong. It took the United States a little bit longer, but they eventually figured out a closed cycle engine. But it was very different from the oxygen rich cycle. The United States pursued a closed loop cycle, but they went with a fuel rich preburner. But wait, we just learned that fuel rich preburners exhaust is so sooty that it pretty much ruins anything, right? Well, sure, if you're using RP1 or any other carbon heavy fuel, that's definitely going to be the outcome. So the United States went with a different fuel, hydrogen. Okay, so now we've avoided the problem of blasting crazy hot high pressure oxygen at anything dear and precious, but now we've opened up a new can of worms. Hydrogen is significantly less dense than RP1 or liquid oxygen. It's so much less dense, it takes a huge and really complex turbo pump to flow the right amount of hydrogen into the combustion chamber. Since RP1 and LOX are relatively similar in density and in ratios, they can be run on a single shaft using a single pre-burner. Because of this, the engineers at Rocketdyne pursued an engine known as the RS-25, which would go on to power the space shuttle. They realized that because of the large difference between the pumps, they might as well have two different pre-burners, one for the hydrogen pump and one for the oxygen pump. So that's what they did. But having two separate shafts created another new problem. Now engineers were putting high pressure, hot gaseous hydrogen on the same shaft right next door to the liquid oxygen pump. If some of that hydrogen would leak out of the pre-burner, it would start a fire in the LOX pump, which is catastrophically bad. Hydrogen is also very hard to contain because it's so not dense, or undense, lightweight. It likes to sneak through cracks and get out anywhere it can. So engineers had to make an elaborate seal to keep the hot hydrogen from sneaking out. The seal required for this is called a purge seal, and it's actually pressurized by helium so that it's the highest point of pressure. So if the seal leaks, it just leaks inert helium. 
It's genius. But take a look at how different the LOX turbo pump and the hydrogen turbo pump seals look. You can tell how much more engineering time and effort had to go into the hydrogen seals. I mean, the people that think of this stuff are nuts. The RS25 is still considered to be about the best engine ever made with a fairly high thrust to weight ratio and unmatched efficiency. Okay, now that we've talked all about the dual pre-burner fuel rich RS25, here's a simplified diagram of that. Now, I didn't bother making the fuel pumps different sizes and I just wanna focus on the flow here and help make that as simple as possible. But do note, both pre-burners of the RS25 run fuel rich. So although they might look the same, they power different pumps. And I'll just let this run here for a few seconds so you can study it for a bit. But don't worry, we'll also put all these up on screen at the same time once we cover them all. So the closed cycle improves the overall performance of the engine and is highly advantageous. So how can it get any better than this? We're finally ready to talk about the full flow stage combustion cycle, which basically just combines the two cycle methods we just talked about. With the full flow stage combustion cycle, you take two preburners, one that runs fuel rich and one that runs oxygen rich. The fuel rich preburners powers the fuel pump and the oxygen rich preburner powers the LOX pump. This means the full flow stage combustion cycle needs to tackle the oxygen rich problems, which again is solved by developing very strong metal alloys. So SpaceX developed their own super alloys in-house that they named SX500. According to Elon Musk, it's capable of over 800 bar of hot oxygen rich gas. That may have been one of the biggest hurdles in developing the Raptor engine. Luckily, the fuel rich side only pumps fuel. So if some of that hot fuel leaks through the seal on the shaft, it just comes in contact with more fuel, which is kind of no big deal. So no need for one of those really, really elaborate seals. Full flow likely wouldn't work with RP-1 due to the coking problems with a fuel rich preburner, but other fuels are still valid to use this design, but more on that in a minute. The advantage of the system is that since both the fuel and the oxidizer arrive in the combustion chamber as a hot gas, there's better combustion and hotter temperatures can be achieved. There's also less of a need for that crazy sealing system as we mentioned earlier. And that's definitely a good thing when you plan to reuse your engine over and over with little to no refurbishment between flights. And lastly, because there's an inherent increase in mass flow or how quickly all the propellant is shooting into the preburner, the turbines can run cooler and at lower pressures because the ratio of fuel and oxidizer needed to spin the turbo pumps is much lower. And think of it this way. In an open cycle, you only want to use as little fuel and oxidizer as possible in the preburner since it's all wasted and you want it to be as hot as withstandable to make it more efficient. But with the full flow cycle, all of the fuel and all of the oxidizer goes through the preburners, so you can burn just exactly as much propellant as necessary to power the turbo pumps. But the cool thing is, your fuel to oxidizer ratios will be so crazy fuel rich and crazy oxygen rich that the temperatures at the turbines will be much lower and this means longer lifespans for the turbo pump assembly. It also means more combustion happens in the combustion chamber and less in the preburner. Now here's the crazy part. Only three engines have demonstrated the full flow stage combustion cycle, ever. In the 60s, the Soviets developed an engine called the RD-270, which never flew, and in the early 2000s, Aerojet and Rocketdyne worked on an integrated powerhead demonstrator called, wait for it, the integrated powerhead demonstrator, which again, never made it past the test stand. And the third attempt at developing a full flow stage combustion cycle engine is SpaceX's Raptor engine. Ta-da! That's right. The Raptor engine is only the third attempt at making this crazy type of engine. It's the first to ever do any type of work and leave a test stand. And fingers crossed, it'll be the first full flow stage combustion cycle engine to reach orbit. Well, actually just about anything this engine does will be a first. This means SpaceX had to tackle some crazy, crazy problems. I mean, not only that same problem that plagues oxidizer rich cycles, like having to have a really, really strong metal alloy, they also had to learn how to control, you know, two different preburners and two different cycles to create the highest pressures of any chamber pressure ever. They just beat the RD-180's record of about 265 bar when they hit 270 bar, and they're not even done. They're hoping for 300 bar inside the combustion chamber. That's nuts, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But before we move on, now that we've done a rundown on all these engine cycle types, let's put them all up on screen and let them run for a bit so you can watch each one and compare them side by side. I know for myself, it helps a lot to see them all together on the same screen at the same time.
Since the Raptor engine can't run a fuel-rich pre-burner using RP-1, you'd think the next most logical choice would be hydrogen. Well, SpaceX didn't opt for either RP-1 or hydrogen, they went with liquid methane. So now we finally have another topic to touch on. Why did SpaceX choose liquid methane for the Raptor engine? What are the qualities that make it advantageous over hydrogen or RP-1? To date, no liquid methane, or otherwise known as methylox engine, has gone to orbit. So what qualities does it have that make it desirable? Let's take a look at methane compared to RP-1 and hydrogen. Let's put methane in between RP-1 and hydrogen. You'll see why here really quickly. So let's start off with perhaps the biggest factor when designing your first stage. The density of the propellant. Having a denser fuel means the tanks are smaller and lighter for a given mass of fuel. A smaller tank equals a lighter rocket. So here's the density of these three fuels measured in grams per liter. In other words, how much does one liter of this stuff weigh, or really, what's its mass? Starting off with RP-1. One liter is around 813 grams. RP-1 is 11 times more dense than hydrogen, which is only 70 grams per liter, and methylox is right in the middle at 422 grams per liter. Remember how airships or zeppelins used to be filled with hydrogen to make them lighter than air? Well, that's because hydrogen is so much less dense than our atmosphere. It makes for an excellent, albeit really flammable, gas for a balloon. I mean, we all remember the Hindenburg, right? It should also be noted that 813 grams per liter is an average for RP-1, but SpaceX chills their RP-1 and their Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy for about a 2-4% to increase in density. But historically, RP-1's density is right around that 813 grams per liter. So in the case of density, methane is kind of right in the middle of the two others. But there's more to it than just density. We also need to take into consideration the ratio of how much fuel is burned compared to how much oxidizer is burned. This is the oxidizer to fuel ratio. So here's where things get a little more interesting and the tables turn just a little bit. Rocket engineers have to take into account the mass of the fuel and the corresponding weight of the tanks. So they don't actually burn propellant at the perfect stoichiometric combustion ratio. They find the perfect happy medium that balances tank size with thrust output and specific impulse. Let's look at the mass ratios for fuel and oxidizer that the engineers have come up with. So for these numbers, RP-1 is burned at 2.7 grams of oxygen to one gram of RP-1. Hydrogen burns at six grams of oxygen to one gram of hydrogen, and methane burns at 3.7 grams of oxygen to one gram of methane. These numbers can now help offset a little the massive difference in density. So let's visualize this to help make it easier to digest. Liquid oxygen is 1,141 grams per liter. It's a little more dense than RP-1. So burning LOX and RP-1 at a 2.7 to 1 ratio, for every liter of LOX, you'd need a little over half a liter of RP-1. Next up, let's do hydrogen. Now with hydrogen being 11 times less dense than RP-1, you'd think it'd need a tank that's 11 times bigger. But luckily, engineers have found that it pays to burn LOX and hydrogen at a 6 to 1 ratio for a good compromise. This means for each liter of LOX, you'd need 2.7 liters of hydrogen. So your fuel tank needs to be approximately 5 times larger compared to RP-1. So yeah, that helps. That's why when we look at a hydrogen-powered Delta IV versus an RP-1-powered Falcon 9, you can see the fuel tank is much smaller than the LOX tank on the Falcon 9, but the Delta IV is about the opposite. The LOX tank is much smaller than its fuel tank. So now let's take a look at methane. This one gets kind of interesting. LOX is 2.7 times more dense than liquid methane, but the burn ratio is 3.7 grams of oxygen to one gram of methane. So you need 0.73 liters of methane for every liter of LOX. In other words, your fuel tank would need to be about 40% bigger for methylox than it would need to be for RP-1, despite RP-1 actually being almost twice as dense and compared to hydrogen, its fuel tank would be about 3.7 times smaller. So the fuel to oxidizer ratio helps make a methane fuel tank a lot closer to an RP-1 tank than it is to a hydrogen tank. Another huge variable with any rocket engine is how efficient it is. This is measured in specific impulse or ISP, but you can think of it kind of like a fuel economy of a gas powered car. So a high specific impulse would be similar to a high mile per gallon or kilometer per liter. The best way to think of a specific impulse is to imagine you had one kilogram of propellant. 
for how many seconds can the engine push with 9.8 newtons of force. The longer it can sip on that fuel while still pushing that hard, the higher its specific impulse, and therefore, the more work it can do with the same amount of fuel. So again, kind of like its fuel economy. So the higher the specific impulse, the less fuel it takes to do the same amount of work, which is a good thing. A fuel efficient engine is extremely important. And now due to the molecular weight of each fuel and their energy released when burned, there's a different potential for how quickly the exhaust gas can be expelled out the nozzle. This means each fuel has a different theoretical specific impulse. In an ideal and perfect world, an RP1 powered engine could achieve about 370 seconds. An ideal hydrogen powered engine could get 532 seconds. And guess what? A methane powered engine is right in the middle with 459 seconds. Real world examples of this though are much lower with RP1 engines seeing around 350 seconds like the Merlin 1D vacuum, around 380 seconds for a methane powered engine like the Raptor vacuum might be someday, and about 465 seconds for a hydrogen powered engine like the RL10B2. Next, let's talk about how hot each fuel burns. A fuel that burns cooler is easier on the engine and potentially makes for a longer lifespan. RP1 can burn up to 3,670 Kelvin, hydrogen 3,070 Kelvin, and if you haven't guessed it by now, methane is again between the two at 3,550 Kelvin. Speaking of thermal considerations, let's look at the boiling point for each of these fuels or at what point does the liquid fuel boil off and turn into a gas? Since all of these fuels need to remain in their liquid state in order to stay dense, the higher the temperature, the easier it is to store the fuel. A higher boiling point also means less or even no insulation on the tanks to keep the propellant from boiling off. And of course, less insulation means lighter tanks. Yay! RP1 has a very high boiling point, even higher than water at 490 Kelvin. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is near absolute zero at a crazy cold 20 Kelvin. That's insanely cold and it takes serious consideration to keep anything at that temperature. And like the Goldilocks it is, methane is between the two at 111 Kelvin, which although that's still very cold and requires thermal considerations, it at least boils off at a temperature similar to LOX. So there's that. And because it's so close to the temperature of LOX, the tanks can share a common dome, which makes the vehicle lighter. LOX and hydrogen's temperatures vary so wildly that LOX will boil off hydrogen and the hydrogen will freeze LOX solid. Now onto the exhaust. What are the byproducts of combustion with these engines? RP1 is really the only one of these three that really pollutes with any unburnt carbons being left in our atmosphere, alongside with some water vapor. But hydrogen only produces water vapor, and methane produces some carbon dioxide and water vapor as well. But an interesting note, now believe it or not, as far as greenhouse gases go, water in the upper atmosphere can be pretty bad. But I'll be doing a video in the future all about how much rockets pollute, talking about their air pollution, also their ocean pollution, and even space debris as a consideration. So stand by, because I think that video is going to be awesome. Now one metric that we're just kind of going to gloss over really quick but and talk about it generally is the cost. And these tend to vary considerably, and it's actually really hard to pin down the exact prices reliably. So. For the considerations, RP1 is basically just a highly refined jet fuel, which jet fuel is a highly refined kerosene, which kerosene is a highly refined diesel. So it's safe to assume it's going to be more expensive than diesel. Hydrogen is also relatively expensive despite being abundant. Refining it, storing it, and transporting it can be hard. But methane, on the other hand, is basically the same thing as natural gas and can be relatively cheap. Now, when you're talking about buying literally tons of fuel, the fuel cost can add up quickly. So, although the cost of fuel shouldn't factor in too much, it certainly is a consideration. But without hard data on this one, I don't even want to put it on our chart. So instead, let's talk about the more important aspect of the fuel. And that's manufacturing it. And here's where we get into specifically why SpaceX sees methane as an important or even a necessary part of the company's future. SpaceX's ultimate goals are to develop a system capable of taking humans out to Mars and back over and over. The Martian atmosphere is CO2 rich. Now combine that with water mining from the surface and subsurface water on Mars through electrolysis and the Sabatier process, the Martian atmosphere can be made into methane fuel. So you don't have to take all the fuel you need to get home with you, you can make it right there using Mars' resources. This is called in-situ resource utilization or ISRU. Now you might be thinking, 
Well, if there's water, can't you just make hydrogen on the surface of Mars for your fuel? Well, yes, but one of the biggest problems with hydrogen and long duration missions is the boiling point of hydrogen. Remember, it takes serious considerations to maintain hydrogen in a liquid state, and that's necessary to be useful as a fuel. So for SpaceX, methane makes a lot of sense. It's fairly dense, meaning the rocket sizes are pretty reasonable. It's fairly efficient, it burns clean, and makes for a highly reusable engine. It burns relatively cool, helping expand the lifespan of an engine, which again is good for usability. It's cheap and easy to produce, and can be easily produced on the surface of Mars. Okay, yeah, we finally made it this far. And now that we have a strong grasp of how different engine cycles operate and the fuels they use, we can finally line them all up side by side and compare their metrics to help us appreciate where each engine sits. So now we're going to line up each engine by their fuel type and their cycles. So let's start off with SpaceX's open cycle Merlin engine that powers their Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets. NPO Energomesh's oxygen-rich closed cycle RD-180 that we see power the Atlas V rocket and Rocketdyne's open cycle F1 that powers the Saturn V, which all three of these engines run on RP-1. Then we have SpaceX's full flow stage combustion cycle Raptor engine that will power the Starship and Super Heavy booster. And then we have Blue Origin's closed cycle oxygen rich methane powered BE4 engine that will power their new Glenn rocket and ULA's upcoming Vulcan rocket. And then we have Aerojet Rocketdyne's closed cycle fuel rich RS-25 engine that powered the space shuttle and will power the upcoming SLS rocket, which runs on hydrogen. A few quick notes here. The Raptor and the BE-4 as of the making of this video are still in development. So the numbers we have here are either their current state of progress, like the Raptor, which is constantly improving literally every day. And in the case of the BE-4, those are the target goals for the engine, which Blue Origin has yet to hit. So just keep that in mind that these numbers are definitely subject to change. And now because of this, don't forget to check in with the article version attached in the description of this video. This video will likely date itself with some of these numbers and I can't update this video, but I can update the website when more info comes through. So if you're looking to use any of these numbers as a source, please, please, please double check the website for any updates. Another fun note quick is look at the RD-180. Now, don't be confused, this is a single engine. It just has two combustion chambers. There's only a single turbo pump that splits its power into two combustion chambers. The Soviet Union was able to solve the crazy hot oxygen rich closed cycle problem, but they were unable to solve combustion instability of large engines. So instead of one large combustion chamber, they made multiple small ones. So first up, let's take a look at their total thrust output at sea level. Since all these engines run at sea level, that's probably a fair place to compare them. Let's go from the least amount of thrust to the most for fun. The Merlin produces 0.84 meganewtons of thrust. The RS-25 produces 1.86 meganewtons. The Raptor currently is at two meganewtons. The BE-4 is hoping to hit 2.4 meganewtons. The RD-180, 3.83 meganewtons. And the F1 is still the king out of these at 6.77 meganewtons. Now there was an engine called the RD-170 which actually produced more thrust than the F1, but since it barely flew, I figured it wasn't as relevant in this lineup. I thought it'd probably be a good idea to go with engines that have actually been used a lot. Thrust is great, but what's maybe just as important when designing a rocket is the thrust to weight ratio, or how heavy the engine is compared to how much thrust it produces. A higher thrust to weight ratio engine ultimately means less dead weight the rocket needs to lug around. Let's start from the lowest to highest here. The lowest is actually the Space Shuttle's RS-25 at 73 to one. Then there's the RD-180, which is 78 to one. Then we have the BE-4 at around 80 to one, but and keep in mind, we don't actually have a really good number on this. So there might be some wiggle room there. Then the F1 is 94 to one. Then we have the Raptor, which is at about 107 to one for now. And lastly, the Merlin is actually the leader here with an astonishing 198 to one thrust to weight ratio. Yeah, that thing is a powerhouse. Okay, thrust is great and all, but who cares how powerful an engine is if it's terribly inefficient? 
So next up, let's check out their specific impulse, which again is measured in seconds. So starting with the least efficient engine, which is the F1 engine at 263 to 304 seconds. Then the Merlin engine at 282 to 311 seconds. Then we get the RD 180 at 311 seconds to 338 seconds. And somewhere in that same ballpark is the BE4, which is around 310 to 340 seconds. Next up is the Raptor engine, which is 330 seconds to around 350 seconds. And lastly, the king here by far is the RS25, which is 366 to 452 seconds. Wow. Now, one of the factors that affect both the thrust and specific impulse is chamber pressure. Now, generally, the higher the chamber pressure, the more thrust and potentially more efficient the engine can be. So higher chamber pressures let an engine be smaller for a given thrust level, also improving their thrust to weight ratio. The baby here is actually the F1, which only had 70 bar in its chamber pressure. Now, I do need to pause here for a second and remind you that 70 bar is still 70 times the atmospheric pressure, or the same amount of pressure you'd experience at 700 meters underwater. Yikes. Okay, so even the lowest chamber pressure is still mind-bogglingly high. So next up is the Merlin engine at 97 bar, then the BE4 will be around 135-ish bar, then the RS25, which is 206 bar, then the RD180, which has been considered the king of operational engines at about 257 bar. That is until the Raptor engine, which is now kind of online, which is considered the new king of chamber pressure at 270 bars currently, and they hope to get that thing up to 300 bar. Again, 300 bar is like being three kilometers deep in the ocean. I can't even fathom. Okay, that's enough of the specs of these engines. Now let's look at their operational considerations, starting with their approximate cost. Now again, this can be kind of hard to nail down, so these are the best estimates that I could come up with. These numbers do factor in inflation to make them all in today's dollar though. Let's go with the most expensive and work our way down to the least expensive engine. The most expensive engine in the lineup is the RS25, which has a sticker price of over $50 million per engine. Yikes. Then we have the F1, which was about $30 million per engine. Then the RD180, which is $25 million per engine. Then the BE4, which is around $8 million per engine. And for the Raptor, Elon has mentioned he thinks he can produce the Raptor for cheaper than or close to the Merlin engine if they can remove a lot of the complexity that the current engine has. So for now, we're gonna say $2 million as a pretty decent ballpark. Then we have the Merlin engine, which is less than a million, I think. Okay, well cost is one thing, but another strong consideration for the cost of the engine is whether or not it's reusable. And here, only the RD180 and the F1 were not reusable, or at least never reused, which is different than all these other engines, which will all be reused multiple times. The RS25 was reused over and over, with the record being 19 flights out of a single engine. Well, well then again, that's after a few months of refurbishment. The Merlin is hoping to see up to 10 flights without major refurbishment. We know a design goal for the BE4 is to be reused up to 25 times, and I think the Raptor engine hopes to see up to 50 flights. But again, aspirations are one thing, we'll see how history treats these claims. But one quick fun little story here is don't forget the Merlin engine which SpaceX currently uses on the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy rockets are already fired a bunch of times before they even make it to the pad. Each engine that is built goes from Hawthorne, California to their test stand in McGregor, Texas where it does a full duration burn. Then those engines go back to California where they're integrated onto the OctaWeb which is at the base of the vehicle. Then they take the entire stage and they take it back out to McGregor for a full duration static fire. So it goes through the whole mission basically again. Then they ship it to the launch pad where it does a short static fire and then it flies the mission. So it's already done like three missions in duration of firing by the time it flies for the first time. So I'm not entirely sure what the most times a single engine has done a full duration burn. We know that some of the cores were sat out on the pad and fired for a really, really, really long time, multiple times over and over. So I think they've probably done almost 10 flight full duration burns out of a single engine. Uh, but you know, I have no doubt they can probably do that if they say, I mean, they have more experience in this than anybody already reusing engines without really refurbishing them. So I'm gonna definitely take their word for it. 
On the topic of price, there's actually some things here that start to get really interesting when we start looking at these numbers. The first is an interesting metric that Elon talked about once in a tweet in February of 2019, saying they hope to make the Raptor get better at their thrust to dollar ratio. Now, this is a really interesting concept when you think about it. Who cares how much an engine costs if one big engine is cheaper than two smaller ones for the same thrust or vice versa? So let's actually take a look at the dollar to kilonewton ratio of these engines. Starting with the most expensive dollar to kilonewton engine, which is the RS25 at a crazy $26,881 to kilonewtons of thrust. Then the RD180, which is $6,527 to one kilonewton, followed by the F1 at $4,431 per kilonewton. And then we get to the BE4, which is $3,330 $33 to one kilonewton, the Merlin engine at $1,170 per kilonewton, and the Raptor at around $1,000 per kilonewton. But now we can go even another step further since we know their dollar to kilonewton ratio, but we also know their reusability potential. Now we can predict their potential cost per kilonewton per flight, which changes based on how reusable these engines actually are. So for starters, since the RD180 and the F1 aren't reusable, their price stays the same. But for the rest of the engines, if we take into account how many flights they have slash will have, now we start to see the RS25 reusability pay off and kind of close the gap, bringing its potential cost down to just $1,414 per kilonewton per flight. But here's where things get crazy. Blue Origin's BE4 has potential to truly be game changing at around $133 per kilonewton over 25 flights, which could make it about as cheap to operate as the Merlin at $117 per kilonewton per flight. But if the Raptor engine truly lives up to its hype, it could bring this number all the way down to $20 per kilonewton per flight. Now that is absolutely game changing. Sure, money and reusability is a 21st century focus for spaceflight, but whatever happened to good old proven reliability? For this, let's first look at how many operational flights each engine has had. Now at the moment of shooting this video, the Raptor and BE4 haven't seen any operational flights, although the Raptor is starting to leave the test stand and is being used on test vehicles like the Starhopper. But for now, neither engine has a real flight record. So let's look at the other engines. First, we have the F1 engine, which was used on 17 flights. Next up is the Merlin engine, which is at 71 flights and catching up quickly to the RD-180, which is at 79 flights. But the king out of these was the RS-25, which saw 135 flights. Now, lastly, how about reliability and service? Between the number of flights and this number, we can get a pretty good sense of how truly reliable an engine is. This number is really hard to just pin down since some of the engines may have shut down early, but the mission was still a success on a few of these. So yeah, so take a few of these with a grain of salt. Again, the BE-4 and Raptor engine haven't flown yet, so those numbers are unavailable. Then we have the Space Shuttle main engine, which is over 99.5% reliable, but that gets hard to define when an engine doesn't fully shut down. And then we have the Merlin at 99.9% .9 reliable. It sure helps when you have 10 engines on each flight of the vehicle and with only one engine ever failing early on in his career. And despite that, that mission was still a success. So the Merlin is a very reliable engine. Now to end this, technically the RD-180 and the F1 are 100% reliable, but with the F1 never having shut down at all in any flight, it gets the bold here. And depending on how you define success and reliability, Technically, the RD-180 is only kind of 100% reliable because it got really lucky once. One time, it shut down six seconds early on an Atlas V mission in 2016. This was due to a faulty valve, but the mission went on to be a success because of some pure luck with the Centaur upper stage having enough spare Delta V to carry out the mission. Had that valve failed even a second earlier, that mission would have failed. Man, seeing all these numbers and considerations, it makes you realize just how many variables go into designing a rocket. I mean, change any one little thing and it can have this massive ripple effect on the entire design and the implementation of the vehicle as a whole. So let's go back over all of this now that we know all the cycles, the fuels, the aspirations of SpaceX to see if we can figure out why the Raptor engine exists and figure out if it's worth all the effort. Let's look at SpaceX's ultimate plan. 
make a rapidly and fully reusable vehicle capable of sending humans to the moon and Mars as inexpensively and routinely as possible. It's not exactly your everyday goal for a rocket, huh? In order to be rapidly and fully reusable, the engine needs to run clean and require low maintenance with simple turbo pump seals and low pre-burner temperatures. Hmm. A methane-fueled, full-flow, staged combustion cycle engine sounds like a good fit. For reliability, redundancy, and scale of manufacturing considerations, it makes sense to employ a lot of engines. In order to scale an engine down but maintain a high output, chamber pressure needs to be high. Hmm, sounds like a methane-fueled, full-flow, staged combustion cycle engine is a good fit. For interplanetary trips, methane makes the most sense because its boiling point makes it usable on long-duration trips to Mars, which, guess what? You can produce methane on Mars, so for interplanetary trips, a methane-fueled, full-flow, staged combustion cycle engine sounds like a good fit. Methane is fairly dense, meaning the tank size remains reasonable, which again is good for interplanetary trips, not needing to lug around a lot of dead weight, making a methane-fueled, full-flow, staged combustion cycle a pretty good fit. Okay, so let's bring this all back around now. Is the Raptor engine really the king of rocket engines? Well, rocket science, like all things, is a complex series of compromises. Is it the most efficient engine? No. Is it the most powerful engine? No. Is it the cheapest engine? Probably not. Is it the most reusable engine? Maybe. But does it do everything really well? Yeah. It is truly a Goldilocks engine, doing everything it needs to do very, very well. It is the perfect fit for your interplanetary spaceship. And despite its complexity, SpaceX is developing this engine at a rapid pace. I mean, knowing how much tweaking SpaceX did to their Merlin engine over a decade, we're just at the infancy of the Raptor engine. It's only gonna get better from here on out, which is crazy. So all in all, the Raptor engine is the king of this application. It's a fantastic engine to fulfill SpaceX's goals for their Starship vehicle. Would it be the king of other applications? Maybe, maybe not. And I'll leave that decision for the rocket scientists and engineers who get to make all those crazy decisions every single day. So what do you think? Is it worth all this hassle to develop such a crazy and complex engine? Is this just the beginning for the Raptor engine? And most importantly, is the Raptor engine really the king of rocket engines? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Okay, I know I say this every video, but I honestly could not have done this video without the help of my Patreon supporters. They not only kept me sane for the past five months as I worked on this video, but they also went over all the data with me. They got, gave me great feedback and suggestions in the edits of this video. Uh, if you wanna help support what I do or provide feedback in videos or help script and research, or if you just wanna hang out and talk space, consider joining our exclusive Discord channel and our exclusive subreddit by becoming a Patreon member by going to patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Thank you guys, seriously, I couldn't have made this video without you. And while you're online, be sure and check out my web store. Seriously, I have really cool things like these F1 t-shirts, uh, tons of other shirts. There's lots of new merchandise popping up in there all the time, so check back often. We have things like grid fit and a coasters and hats and shirts and mugs and prints. Just literally tons of cool rocket stuff. So if that's your type of thing, be sure and check out my web store, everydayastronaut.com slash shop. And then click on the music tab if you wanna check out any of the songs used in this video. That's all music that I've written over the years. Uh, you can listen to it on Apple iTunes and Spotify and Google Music, all that stuff. And also there's a playlist right here on YouTube for music video versions of that too as well, which is a fun way to watch and listen. So show it to a friend. Thanks everybody, that's gonna do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people.